Hey guys, welcome to another video from Rock the JVM. I'm Daniel, and in this video, I'm going to discuss higher order functions for object oriented programmers. So, this video is for the programmer who is familiar with the Scala concepts and structure but has the object oriented programming principles deeply ingrained. This video will not attempt to change them but rather show you how you can map these principles to the very abstract functional programming concept of higher order function or HOF. Now, as usual, I will recommend that you code along with me just to see how these examples lay out, and whenever you need to get back to these concepts, just refer back to this video. Now, for your convenience, this video is also available in written form at rockthejvm.com forward slash blog. All right, so I'm back in my development environment where I've created an object that I called Hoffs for OOP. And I've made it an object so that if you create this as an application, you can add a main method in which you can test your own code. All right, so here's what I'm going to start with. You're probably aware that the apply method in Scala is treated in a special way. So I'm going to define a class just to show you how that works. I'm going to name this applicable. And uh, this class will have a small method called apply, which takes an x as an int and just assume it returns x plus 1. Now, objects of this type, if I instantiate an applicable, let's call this applicable as new applicable, can obviously call this apply method. If I create, for example, applicable.apply with the argument one, I would return the value two. But in Scala, the apply method is special and allows objects to be invoked themselves. So something like this, applicable invoked with the argument one. And this is actually equivalent to applicable.apply with the argument one. So the apply method allows objects to be invoked like functions. And so objects with apply methods like these can behave like functions. They take arguments and they return results. The Scala standard library actually has built-in types for function-like objects, which are nothing else but plain instances with apply methods. Let me give you an example. So these are function objects. I'm going to define a val called, let's call this incrementer, as new, and I'm going to use the Scala standard type function one, and you notice that Scala has function all the way up to 21. So function one with the types int and int, meaning a function that takes an int argument and returns an int result. And this function trait actually has an apply method that I'm going to implement here on the spot. And uh, given an x, I'm going to return x plus 1. This incrementer is a plain JVM object, much like this applicable that I've defined above. So I can say, for example, incrementer dot apply with the argument 2, and uh, I would return the value 3, or incrementer invoked with the argument 2, and I would re return 3. Now, Scala being the nice functional language it is, allows for nice and concise syntax sugars. So I'm going to define a val, let's call this incrementer alt as, and I'm going to use the shorthand notation x colon int arrow x plus one, which is nothing else but a new function one definition. And uh, if you hover over this warning, syntactic sugar could be used. And uh, if you define um, a uh, lambda, an anonymous function much like the way I did here on the screen, this is actually equivalent to defining a new function one with int and int whose apply method is whatever I wrote here on the right hand side of the error sign. And obviously this incrementer alt that I've defined also has an applied method. So if I said incrementer alt invoked with the argument two, that would be three and incrementer alt dot apply with the argument two, that will also be three. Cool. Now, naturally, because these so-called functions are nothing but objects with apply methods, they can be passed around as arguments or returned as results. So the functions which take other functions as arguments or and or return other functions as results are called higher order functions or HOFs for short. So I'm expecting this to make sense for object oriented programmers. So these function objects in Scala are nothing else but JVM objects with apply methods. And this is how the Scala functional programming paradigm is actually implemented on top of the JVM, which was primarily built for Java, which is an object oriented language. So this is how a functional programming language is actually mapped on the JVM. 
Now, here's something I often ask people to do in my trainings after the, I explain what I've already done here in this video. So let's go ahead and define an example or exercise if you choose to take it. So let's define a function. I'm going to define that as n times, which takes a function int arrow int and the number n, which is an int, and returns another function of type int error int. The type int error int, by the way, is syntax sugar for function one, so there's nothing to rocket science there. And this returned function needs to have the following property. The function that I return over here, applied to a certain argument, needs to invoke this function f n times on this argument. So let's assume I have, for example, that's called let's call this g, if I name g as n times with a function f with the number 30, then g applied to an argument, let's call this g of x, is f applied to 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 x 30 times. Okay, so I would like us to implement a method here that takes a function and a number n and returns another function which is the application of f n times over an argument. So if you want to take a challenge and implement this yourself, feel free to pause this video and I'm going to write an implementation for this. So here's how I'm going to write this. I'm going to write as follows. I'm going to say if n is less than or equal to zero, then I'm going to return a function x colon int arrow x. So this will be the identity function. Now this is a function because this is how I've defined the method to return. So I've defined the method to return a function int arrow int. And this is an object that given an argument returns that argument. Otherwise, I will return a function that given an argument x arrow int, this function will return n times with f and n minus 1 applied to f of x. Now, this is where people start to get a little baffled because this code is very, very, very concise. So this code is concise and often hard to read, especially if you've not done a lot of this before. So it's natural if it takes a few minutes to unwrap. So one of the questions that I asked first is, how do you read this in the first place? So let's take a look at the code. If n is zero or less, then we return a function that given an argument returns the argument. This is the identity function, which I hope makes sense. Otherwise, we return a function that given an argument applies the n minus one function onto f of x. So it's as if I said dot apply to f of x. Now let's do a small breakdown. So if I wrote n times with f and 4, because 4 is not less than or equal to 0, then I will return x arrow, so x int arrow, n times with f and n minus 1, so f and 3, applied to f of x. Now what is n times of f and 3 applied to f of x? So let's compute n times of f and 3. This is x arrow n times with f and 2 applied to f of x. Similarly, we could write n times with f and 2 is x arrow n times with f and 1 applied to f of x, and n times with f and 1 is x arrow n times with f and 0 applied to f of x by the same mechanism. Now, what is n times with f and 0? Well, n times of f and 0 is the identity function that given an argument returns that argument. So that is x arrow x. Well, given that n times of f and 0 is the identity function, let's apply that recursively backwards. So n times of f and 0 applied to this argument returns this argument. So f of x. So we can say that n times of f and 1, I've mistaken here, so n times, n times with f and 1 is a function that applies f to the argument. So n times of f of 1 is x arrow f of x. Let's re-erase that. So n times of f and 1 is a function that 
given an argument just applies f to that argument. Cool, now let's use this over here backwards. So n times of f and 1 applied to f of x is f applied to the argument, which is f of x. Let's erase that as well. So n times of f and 2 is a function that given an x applies f twice to the argument. Now, given n times of f and 2, we can actually apply that here. So let's invoke an apply, and that would be f applied to f applied to the argument, and the argument is f of x. So notice that we now have n times with f and 3 applies f three times to the argument. And in a very similar fashion, we will obtain n times with f and 4 applies f four times to the argument. So this will be f applied to f applied to f applied to the argument f of x. So this will be the breakdown of how this function will actually work. Cool, so that is how we read and we break down the implementation of this function. If you want, you can pause the video and take a couple of minutes to actually break this down yourself. So that was Q1. Now, for question two that I often ask a lot is, when are these functions actually created? If we read the code, we can see that all these intermediate functions over here are not actually created until we actually invoke the result function. So for example, if I said, let's call this val, let's call this f4 as n times with f and 4, and let me define an f, let's call this x int arrow x plus 1. Okay, and I've defined an f4 as n times with f and 4. Well, this will be x arrow f of f of f of f of x. But all these intermediate functions are not actually created until I actually invoke f4 of x. That means that when I call n times with f and 4, by the implementation of this n times method, I only return an arrow function. So this will be x colon int arrow n times with f and 3 applied to f of x. It's as if I said, let's call this f4 alt as x colon int arrow n times with f and 3 apply to f of x. So this will be a single object, not multiple functions intermediate created. So it's as if I said new function 1 with int and int, in which the apply method is actually n times with f and 3 apply to f of x. So notice a single object is being created here from a JVM perspective. So from, from an object-oriented perspective, a single object will be constructed. On the other hand, if I called f4 of 5, so if I invoke f4 with a real argument, then all the intermediate functions, n times of f and 1, n times of f and 2, n times of f and 3, and n times of f and 4, will be created so that I could invoke f4 of 5. So all the function objects will be created for this particular case. So that was for question number two. Question number three is, okay, Daniel, I understand the mathematical definition. I understand this recursion, but to an object-oriented programmer like me, how are these functions actually created in memory? Because I understand how these functions are being applied and I can understand the recursion, but where are these functions actually stored in memory? How, how should I think about them in an object-oriented fashion? So it's worth coming back to the origins of functions that I've explained above. So let me rewrite the code with the original types. Let me copy this method n times, and uh, I'm going to call this n times original. And instead of the sugar types int error int and all these recursive implementations, I'm going to use the original types. I'm going to use function one with int and int, and this will be another function one of int and int, which in terms of Java, these are only interfaces. So this function one is a trait in Scala, which to a Java programmer is equivalent to an interface. So instead of x arrow, x colon int arrow x, I'm going to return a new function one, in which with the int and int types, in which the def apply 
looks like X. Let me arrange the code so that you can read it better. So if N is less than or equal to zero, I'm going to return one of these function one types in which the apply method takes an argument and returns that same argument. So this is a JVM object. In the exact same fashion, instead of this arrow function, this lambda, I'm going to return a new function one with int and int in which the def apply method takes an argument, let me arrange the code, so the apply method takes an argument and as an implementation it returns n times original with the same function and n minus 1 applied to f of x. Now somewhat counterintuitively it's easier for object-oriented programmers and especially those with a Java background to read this code as opposed to the previous one which was more concise. Whereas the more experienced you are with Scala, the more bloated this code will seem because it has the explicit function types and Scala programmers like to be concise. If you come from a very heavy object-oriented background, this code will shed some light onto how the functions are being created as JVM objects because we're now talking about plain JVM objects, not necessarily as functions. And if you track this down in the same style that we saw above, like here, you will see how the function objects are being spawned in memory. Now, immediately after that, a question that I get often asked is, isn't this using too much memory? Now, this question will take a short answer. Because this function is recursive, it will create a bunch of these function objects, but these function objects are very light because they only contain a small apply method and they're also very short-lived, which makes them eligible for garbage collection from the JVM. So they will be quickly cleared. So I hope that will address the memory concerns. All right, so I hope this was useful. I'm Daniel, and you can find this article at rockthejvm.com forward slash blog in written form, and you can follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn with the links in the description attached to this video. Now, I'm dying for feedback, so please leave yours in the comments, and if you like this video, go ahead and subscribe, because more videos like this will be coming soon. Until next time, thank you for watching.